Hello! In this video, we are going to look at solving one dimensional finite difference equations when the equations are non linear. So, if you've seen my previous videos, finite difference method is used to solve ODEs and PDEs, that is, ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations. It requires discretizing the domain into discrete pieces with a finite difference between them such that derivatives become finite difference equations. And thus, the finite difference method is a numerical method. We saw in the last video how to solve an equation like this, with boundary conditions. It was accomplished by taking a domain in which to evaluate the function and splitting it into discrete trunks of space h. The goal was then to find the function f of x at discrete points. We saw that the differential term could be turned into a finite difference expression in which the second derivative could be converted into equations that only depend on the function evaluated at different grid points. This then led to seven equations for the nine grid points, with the remaining two equations coming from the boundary conditions. This led to a total of nine linear equations for nine unknowns which is the function evaluated at f0, f0.25, etc, etc. These simultaneous equations could then be placed into a matrix format as shown and solved by recognising that this matrix equation is in the form a times f equals b, which can be solved by pre-multiplying both sides by a inverse to get the final solution f, which is the approximation to the solution of the differential equation evaluated at the grid points. This is known as a direct method. The solution f is found directly from the finite difference equations. So that's what we saw in the last video. Now what about this problem? Well the left hand side, as we know, can be approximated with the finite difference method by using this relationship. But the right hand side cannot be expressed as a linear combination of grid points. And for anyone wondering, the solution to this differential equation is just f of x equals 1 of x. But for now, let's say we don't actually know how to solve this, or let's say the solution could be non-analytical. If we rearrange the equation and drop the approximation, we arrive at this expression, which does not satisfy our need for simultaneous equations. The equation is non-linear. We have a term that depends on the power of a point. And so just a quick description of this equation. This equation is a first order, nonlinear, ordinary differential equation. So let's look a bit deeper at what the nonlinear part means. So consider the two equations above. The left one is linear, the right one is nonlinear. If we apply a linear combination of inputs, we get the following equations. In the linear case, we can see that the equation is the same as simply adding the equation with the input a times f of x with the equation with the input b times f of x. For the nonlinear case, we see that the equation is not the same as simply just adding the two equations with input a times f of x with b times f of x. There is a difference. So this equation is non-linear. Any linear combination of inputs does not return the sum of the outputs for each individual input. So going back to our problem at hand, we're stuck. We do not have a linear combination of grid function evaluations to use direct matrix methods for solving simultaneous equations. So what are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to be given some boundary conditions to ensure that we have a unique solution. We can then can go ahead and construct our grid as we normally do. And for now, we're going to choose h equals 0.25. Now we know the finite difference approximation to the grid is given by this equation, but we still have the nonlinear term. And this equation leads us to a total of five equations for the five grid points that we must solve. And again, just to reiterate, we can't use linear algebra to solve these due to the nonlinear terms. So here's a crazy suggestion. What if we simply guessed what the answer might be? 
If we guess the linear curve between the boundaries, we can evaluate using the finite difference method, since the nonlinear terms become constant. So let's rearrange the equation slightly by multiplying by 2h to be left with this expression. Then go ahead and put that in our matrix format. And remember, if f is indeed the solution, then the matrix will turn the following, where af equals b. So what does it equal? Well, it turns out for our given linear input, this is not the solution, which is most unfortunate. A multiplied by F does not equal B. So what we're going to do? Well, again, let's rearrange the equation. So we'll move B over and do B minus A times F is equal to another vector, which we'll call E for the error. Now, bear with me here. What happens if we take our error and multiply it by some constant omega? That is between 0 and 1. We can then add this small constant omega times this error, which was the difference between what the solutions to our simultaneous equations are and the matrix equation. Add those together. We then set the next value of f, which is f of n plus 1, to be the previous value, which we have now called f of n, plus this small scaled vector. This method is known as the modified Richardson iteration method. The value f is updated using the previous value of f along with the error term. This type of approach is called an iterative method. The solution starts with an initial guess and applies an iterative method to find the next guess to the solution which should be closer than the previous guess. The system to solve is a linear system since we have made a guess at the solution and hence the nonlinear terms become linear, meaning we have overall linear equations. And so here we have an example of the modified Richardson iteration method with a constant omega of 0.125. The analytical solution is in blue and our initial guess is in red. As we perform iterations, we can see that the solution f is updated and becomes closer to the real solution. It is said to converge. Since the analytical solution is rarely known, we need a way to know when to stop. To do this, we calculate the sum of the square differences between successive iterations and stop when that difference reaches some minimum value. We can see that this value decreases with every iteration that is to say, it asymptotically approaches a minimum value. The solution here takes over 100 iterations and gives an OK estimate to the true analytical solution. If we had allowed this to run for an infinite amount of time, it would eventually approach the analytical solution. Can we speed up the convergence? If we change the omega value, we can see that the number of iterations required changes too. Surprisingly, the minimum number of iterations does not favor low or high values of omega. Instead, there is an optical value of omega. If we play the comparison again, you can see that the larger omega results in much more rapid swings than for low values of omega, requiring a longer time to settle down, so it requires more iterations for the solution to settle. Conversely, small value of omega results in much less rapid swings, but at the expense of each iteration is making much less progress, and so also takes a large number of iterations to converge. All three of these solutions are the same after reaching the minimum convergence criteria, but the iterations required to reach each of them varies. An omega of 0.25 reaches the stopping point faster than both a larger or smaller value for this particular equation with this particular number of grid points. Now let's look at what happens if the omega parameter is too large. We see that the solution begins to oscillate wildly. These oscillations grow, which means our guess of the solution becomes worse and worse. So our iterative method is said to be diverging. Our solution is divergent. We are getting further and further away from the true solution with each iteration. A good indication of this behaviour 
is to examine the sum of the squared difference between successive iterations. As you can see in this case, this value is actually growing between iterations, whereas previously we saw that it was always decreasing. Now let's look what happens if we decrease the step size. Here we can see two different step sizes, h equals 0.1 and h equals 0.25. We can see that the approximation for a smaller step size is better than for a larger step size. In this particular case, we have fixed the value of omega and we can see that convergence is slower for the smaller step size, but the answer is more accurate. So it's a fair trade in this case. In fact, at this point, it is probably worth mentioning that whether the solution converges or not depends on a number of factors. The convergence of an iterative method depends on the method used, the step size, and any tuning or damping parameters. So for example, in our modified Richardson iteration method, the omega can be thought of as a damping factor, and of course, the initial guess. And quite importantly, a bad initial guess can lead to rapid divergence, and a good initial guess can lead to rapid convergence. Luckily, the main application of the finite difference method is in physical problems, and so the class of solution is often known, so good initial guesses can be made. And it also should be noted that the problem at hand that we're trying to solve here is difficult. It's a first order nonlinear ODE. Such problems act are actually more often than not more difficult to solve than second order equation. It's partly to do with the fact that the differential equation involves gradients and not curvatures. And without going into too much detail, it stems from the fact that our finite difference approximation leads to an indefinite matrix. And so iterative methods are not just used for nonlinear equations. You could also use them for linear equations. And in fact, they can be used on any system of equations. Because sometimes there are just too many equations to solve using direct methods. Because direct methods tend to involve calculating inverses, which is a very expensive operation, especially to form on large matrices. Whereas an iterative method is just doing matrix multiplication, which is typically very fast. In general, however, direct methods are superior since they solve the system exactly, whereas iterative methods are not guaranteed to converge. Some tinkering may be required. There is some hope, however. There are many different iterative methods, and some are much faster than others. So some iterative methods for iterative solving nonlinear ODEs with a finite difference approximation are listed here. Each one may have excellence in convergence, stability, computation time, or memory usage and may in fact exploit certain properties or symmetries from the systems of equations. Some will even precondition the matrix A and the vector B to be more likely to solve. And so in summary of the finite difference method, it is used to solve any ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation, whether it be linear or nonlinear. It requires discretizing the domain into discrete pieces with a finite difference between the pieces, such that derivatives become finite difference equations. For linear equations, the value of the functions can be solved for directly. And finally, nonlinear ODEs and PDEs require iterative methods to solve. Such methods are not as simple as plug in and go, as they often require some thought as to their choice of parameters and things like preconditioners. And so that's where I'll leave this video. In the next video, we'll see how we can solve 2D linear partial differential equations like this one by using what we have learned so far from the one dimensional case. So stay tuned.